Well, good morning again. I'm going to ask that you take your Bibles and turn to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. We have been in a series called Inside Out Living, and uh, we are really just working our way through chapter 4, verse 17 of Ephesians to chapter 5, verse 17. And uh, Paul, in this section, um, writes a lot of practical information for his church, for his people, and so we are kind of just journeying together, um, as I said, through these, through these verses. So we're grateful that we can be together again to um, listen to what the Lord might have to say to us this morning. So let's just pray before we look at these uh, verses before us. Father, we recognize this morning that unless your Holy Spirit shows up and comes and showers us with your presence and with your glory, it will just be another Sunday. It'll just be another day of the week. But Lord, we've gathered as your people, as your children, to worship you, to exalt you, to recognize your rightful place in all of the universe as King of kings and Lord of lords. It is our privilege to lift you up and to honor you, to thank you. Father, as we gather now at this point in time in our, our gathering, we're asking that as we open your word that your spirit would come and that, God, you would unblock our spiritual eyes and unblock our spiritual ears, that, that God, we might be able to connect with you we might be able to hear that still small voice because Lord we know that your truth here in your word is alive and it's active it's it's meant to transform us it's meant to change us it's it's meant to bring us life it's meant to bring purpose and and direction and God, for many of us, we've at many times in our journey wandered and got off track with you. And so even this morning, I, I pray that as we study your word, as we, as we look at these few verses that are before us, that God, in some way, through your spirit, you would connect with each one of our hearts, that, that God, we would know that we have heard your voice And so, Father, we pray that you would do what only you can do in this time that we have together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when we use the word church um, in today's social landscape, uh, what first comes to mind in many people's thinking is a building. Church, building. But that really is not a biblical understanding of what God had in mind, what Jesus had in mind, when he talked about the church in his word. In fact, the word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia. And essentially, it means the assembling of called out ones. It's the gathering of God's called out people who make up this thing that's called the church. God has called uh, individuals. God has called people just like you and myself. God has called human beings to himself for redemption from sin. And he has called us to be his representatives in this world. God's desire is to live 
his life in us and then through us individually and then corporately. So in the Bible, there's a number of um, descriptive phrases or words that talk about the church. Um, in Psalm 89.7, we're, we're told that the church is the assembly of the saints. In, in Colossians 1.24, where uh, God, uh, Paul talks about the body of Christ being the church. In Revelation 21.9, uh, the church is called the bride of Christ. In Ephesians 3.15, it's called a family. In Ephesians 2.19, it's called the household of God. Now, what I want us to, to notice is that each of those few descriptive words, those few descriptive phrases, paints a picture for us of an organism that is living and personal and intimate and relational. You see, Jesus didn't die for a building. He died for human beings. He didn't die for external things like architecture or structure or ministries or programs or societies or, or clubs. The blood of Jesus was, was offered up for your very life and mine. And so when he brings us into this living organism called the church, his, his kingdom, he wants us, he desires for us, he longs for us to live in harmony. He longs for us to be unified. He, he longs for us to have intimate relationships with one another. It's for this reason that Paul surfaces here, emerges for us, surfaces, brings to light the impediments, the sins, the, the cancerous evils that can and will break down his plan and his will for the church. Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. It's a new work. It's, it's people just like you and I who have been redeemed from their sinful old life. But you know and I know that whenever a group of people come together, redeemed or not, there's the potential for, for things to begin to clash. And so um, Paul, through the, the power of the Spirit and the teaching of the Word, wants wants to protect us from Satan's way of getting in and bringing division. He wants us to work as a unit. He wants us to be a family. And, and we're going to see how important that is as we move forward through the rest of of this study. So here this morning, we come in chapter 4 of Ephesians to verse 31. And this is what Paul writes to us. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and, and, and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. And then in verse 32, he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Paul begins by helping us to see that the instructions he's giving to us here in his word are not just for a select few. He says, let all. In other words, you who consider yourself a Christ follower, let every part of the following be put away from you. And so then he, and then he, he, he puts before us six forms of, of wickedness or evil that are 
part of our old self, part of the flesh, part of the, the sinful nature that, that we were carrying with us until we met Jesus. These, these um, characteristics of the old self we have talked about, they tarnish us, they stain us, they, they corrupt us, they, they drag us down from the kind of life that Jesus desires for us. And so there are six things that are listed here. And the, and the first one that he surfaces is bitterness. And bitterness is really um, smoldering resentment. Smoldering resentment. You wronged me in some way. You hurt me. You angered me. And so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold that hurt over your head. What do we call that? We call that a grudge. You hurt me, you hurt my pride, you injured a, a piece of my uh, insecure self, and so I'm going to choose to hold that wrong over your head. When that happens, this is what... Is, this is what it looks like. This is what it sounds like. Then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you back. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start thinking in this, in this realm of how am I going to go about hurting you like you hurt me? And what happens is, is that begins, those thoughts begin to um, smolder and fester. And, and, and they begin to grow, and, and they find um, a place where they can just kind of linger in our minds. And so now it becomes a stronghold in my life that keeps me from experiencing God's very peace and presence. And it keeps me from having the kind of relationship that God wants me to have with you. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. In the Hebrew culture, any um, poisonous plant uh, was considered a bitter plant. Now, what does poison do? Poison ultimately destroys. It, it, it terminates. It, it devastates. It, it, it kills. Now, a root may be small. It may um, be slow in its growth. But if it carries poison, it's malignant. It's cancerous. It's dangerous. And in the end, it's deadly. Someone has wisely said this, bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. Bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. So Paul is saying, let all your smoldering resentment towards someone else be put away, be done away with. But then Paul secondly lifts up this thing called wrath. And again, wrath is rage that says, I will get you back. You think you can say that, you think you can do that, you think that you can be that and get away with it. Well, think again because I'm going to get even with you. Do you hear the wrath in my voice? Proverbs 22, 24 says this, make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor, nor go with a wrathful man. You see, some of us are just waiting for the right moment, the right situation to just kind of let loose on someone, someone who has injured us in some way. And Paul says, 
put that away. Be done with that. And then there's anger. And anger is a settled inward resentment. Because of what you have said to me, or done to me, or thought of me, all of that just infuriates my heart, and now I'm just kind of seething with anger. Once again, I'm out to get you. You've made me angry. Someone has said anger is one letter short of danger. An obvious sign that, that my hurt has now turned into sin is when instead of uh, attacking the problem that's at hand, I'm now out to attack the wrongdoer. It's no longer about the, the little situation, and oftentimes that's all it really is. It's just a stupid little thing that we've got angry about, but it's got blown up. And now I'm going after my wife instead of going after the little leftover brownie that she left me. She took the big one, left me the little one. Got in an argument over it. I started attacking her and it was all about a stupid brownie. You know, I mean, it's stupid stuff like that. But that's exactly what happens, isn't it? Like we just allow anger to like well up in us and we go berserk. Proverbs 16.32 says this. That was just an illustration. We don't, need, we don't even have brownies right now. So that's <laughs> <laughs> but I do like brownies. So. Proverbs 16.32 says this, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Wow. If we could just allow God to get that to, to be part of our mindset, wouldn't life be different for us? And then Paul surfaces this word clamor. And uh, clamor is essentially violent, aggressive outbursts of anger. This is like the person who gets on Facebook or social media and kind of just lets loose with their tongue. Christians are often best at this because, you know, I'm a Christian. I can't allow anybody to know that I'm angry. But all of that anger gets pent up and it gets put under the rug and, and now there's this aggressiveness and it can be released um, through a social media post rather than me releasing it face to face. And I can really let others have it. And many, if not most of those who read my post, they'll, they'll never really know who I am. You see, clamor, again, is when all of this pent-up, unresolved anger gets released. And then there's slander. Slander is when I use my, my tongue to insult you. And so the way that I cover over my hurt is that now I'm out to hurt you. And so I will offend you. I will insult you. I will abuse you with my words. I will get back at you with my actions. That's slander. Slander is literally, literally speech or action that injures your name or your reputation or, or your character. And Jesus is saying, put off slander. And then there's malice, the last descriptive word that he uses here. The word malice is, is kind of a, um, a word that kind of wraps up all kinds of evil, all kinds of wickedness that come together and mixes together and seeks to do destruction and damage. How many of us have, have in time put our hurts and our pain and our anger and our feelings of insecurity in the back compartment of our mind or hidden it under the rug of our soul and then at just the right time we're like a firecracker and all this malice comes out of our, 
out of our lives, out of our mouths, out of our actions. You see, that's ultimately where unresolved relational sin gets us. And so Paul says, put away from you. In other words, remove it, eliminate it, amputate it. Because it's holding you back from the life that Jesus has for you. And these kinds of wickedness can just continue to, to break us down. And we get so, we get to this place in our lives where we're just ineffective because our minds are consumed with getting back at somebody who's injured me or injured my pride. Now then, Paul goes on and he gives us the prescription, the, the remedy, the, the treatment, the exchange that, that need, needs to take place for doing what's right. And so in verse 32, he says, be kind to one another. It's kind of like, wait a minute. You just gave us all those incredible words describing the most wickedness the, uh, of all kinds of evil, and now all of a sudden, the next two words are be kind. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. That's a big difference. That's like two ends of the spectrum that are going on here. And so we gotta get our, our hearts and our minds around what, what he's really grasping at. And so to understand kindness, you need to understand that kindness is a, is, is a gentle, tender concern for others. It's a gentle, tender concern for others. Now, let me just say this once again. Kindness is not some mechanical, artificial, external, plastic kind of I'll do it because you said I have to do it kind of thinking or mentality. That's what we call legalism in the church. Rather, kindness is an internal change of heart that can only come from Jesus himself. In fact, the idea behind the word is that our insides, my soul, my heart, that which makes me me, is easily touched. That's what the, that's what the word literally means in the Greek, that I'm easily touched. Kindness has a, an environment or a, or, or a, a, um, a sense of, of gentleness and sensitivity, and graciousness. And so Paul adds this word tender-hearted there. When my skin is tender, it, it doesn't have a very hard, it doesn't take a very hard touch to make it feel comforted. It doesn't take much to feel pain. When my heart is tender, it's easily affected. It's sensitive towards you, it's delicate towards you, it's, it's sympathetic towards you. In fact, the kind of kindness that, that Paul describes here, it's so extensive and it's so deep that it literally is able to replace all my bitterness and all my wrath and all my anger and all my clamor and all my slander and all my malice. That's how big and wide and deep kindness really is from God's perspective. So we're to be kind, we're to be tender-hearted, and we're to be forgiving. Now how to forgive is quite literally a whole sermon in itself. So for the sake of time, let me just say this. When you hurt me, when you injure my insecurity, 
when you go after and damage my pride, I have two choices in the way that I will respond to you. If I revert back to my old self, my flesh, my sinful spirit, I'm going to respond with anger. And because I respond with anger, in time I will become bitter and wrathful and slanderous. That's the result of responding out of my old nature. Or I can respond with kindness because now I'm going to choose to remember the way that I was like when Jesus came and found me in my pool of sin and thus forgave me. You see, forgiveness isn't some flippancy, some flippant idea or attitude towards sin. Forgiveness, true forgiveness, genuine forgiveness, sees the sin, names the sin, deals with the sin correctly, scripturally, and then covers the sin. Forgiveness, we have to understand, is always costly. Forgiveness is not easy. If it was easy, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But it costs a great deal to be a forgiving person. In fact, forgiveness costs God his own son. And it's also going to cost us the taste of revenge. And it's going to cost us the pleasure of holding on to a grudge. And it's going to cost us the, the pride of superiority. But it rewards us with a pureness and a peacefulness and a lightheartedness that money can't buy. You see, when I have a kind and tender heart by the power of the Holy Spirit, not only am I at peace in my soul, but I'm able to be at peace with you. And you're able to be at peace with me. And together we can be the church that Jesus desires us to be. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to start moving into, Paul's going to start moving into what really love looks like. And we're going to see that what the world is looking for, only the church has the opportunity to experience. But if we're living in disunity, if we kind of just come with our masks on and pretend that I'm okay with you and you're okay with me, even though you stole my brownie or you ate my cookie, listen, eventually we're going to be at each other's throat. Now what does that say to the world? There's just another club. That's just another society. That's just another place with four walls around it. That's not what we want to be. We want to be a family where the glory of Jesus is radiated out beyond these four walls. But understand that it first starts, it first starts right here. It first starts with us. We have to learn to be willing to empty ourselves of us every moment of every day and say, Jesus, I don't have it in me. I don't have the love in me. I don't have the kindness in me. I don't have the tenderheartedness in me that I need to love my spouse, that I need to love my kids, that I need to love my coworkers, that I need to love my neighbors, that I need to love those people that hurt me so deeply. I don't have it, Jesus. But Jesus, I'm, I, I'm emptying myself of me. 
And I'm asking that you would come and and just fill me with your presence and do in me and through me what only you can do. C.S. Lewis once said this, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Let's pray. Father, once again, we recognize that the life you call us to live is not a life that we can live in our own power. We can't manufacture it. We can't make it happen in our own power or in our own strength. But rather, Lord, we are completely reliant upon you to do in us and through us what only you can do. And so again, Lord, our hearts cry out that you would, that you would give us a longing for your glory. That you would give us a longing for your truth that you would plant inside of us a hunger and a deep desire to want nothing more than you in this world. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.